Welcome to Comedy Wham Presents. I'm your host, Laura Smith. ComedyWham.com is your place to go for all Austin comedy. Comedy Wham Presents is how we bring you glimpses into the lives of comedians in and around Austin. My guest today has appeared on festivals such as Moon Tower Comedy Festival, Funny or Die's Oddball Fest, and the Las Vegas Punk Rock and Bowling Festival, just to name a few. He currently has two albums out, his debut, High Lonesome, and his most recent, Monster Ballads. And now, Comedy Wham presents Jay White Cotton. Jay. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I didn't want to breathe while you're reading that. <laughs> it's so weird to read. I was telling you, it's so weird to read in front of people. Yeah, I, I don't know. normally do it, and well, I'm like, uh. And I, I figured uh, not having that. <sighs> <laughs> into the microphone. No, it would have been great. It would have been great. During my own stupid <laughs> intro. Uh, you did that very NPR. That was very nice. Thank you. I was thank waiting you, for like you. the vibraphone to click in. <laughs> I used to channel the guy, I think he recently passed away, but the guy that used to host um, the AMC Classics or, or T- Turner Classic oh, yeah, Movies. Yeah, 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 yeah. I used to kind of try to channel him for Robert some something reason. Or... Robert, not Stack. I want to say yeah. Stack, but I know, yeah. Some old guy who knew tr- meaningless trivia. Some old guy. That's who I would channel. So... I think it's old an old man is my spirit animal for some reason. I don't know why. But yeah, uh Valerie tends to to do the Terry Gross like nobody's business, so yeah. I have to have to do something a little different, I guess. Yeah, it, uh, uh, you have been listening <laughs> to oh. close people talking into a microphone <laughs> as gently as possible. Fresh air. <laughs> because our listeners are very scared. <laughs> They're scared after the election. <laughs> Aren't we all? Well, okay. I'm gonna give you a little icebreaker question. Yeah, bring it. Um, open book. If you had to describe yourself, like your persona, holy shit, in an adjective. Okay, let's start with what's an adjective. <laughs> a descriptive word. Okay, about uh, a noun. Okay, good. I was worried you'd do an adverb on me. Um, no, I don't nothing with out. an ly. I um an an adjective. Mm-hmm. I I don't know how to describe myself. Like uh, I'm still trying to find who I am. Okay. Like, or I'm not really concerned with myself. Mm-hmm. That's the other side of it. Like uh, before you hit record, you were having the most fantastic story about being a prison <laughs> therapist <laughs> in the middle of Southeast Texas of yeah. Beaumont, and I was way more interested in that. <laughs> I was really mad you weren't recording that. <laughs> Oh, man. Have I ever talked about that on any of the shows? Probably not. Yeah, you're probably know. more interesting than half the people you're interviewing. Not at all. We go to a hotel. We we, we say some pre-designed jokes and then come <laughs> back. You're working with murderers and thieves and <laughs> my dad. Oh, there were only a couple of murderers that I can remember. But <laughs> Convicted. It was pre-release. so oh, most, okay. they were gonna, most of them were going to go home. So you're so. doing the rehab side. Yeah, yeah. See how I flipped it? I don't want to talk about it. I know. Like, I know. I'm I trying see to get, that. I I'm get trying to get it. past that. Uh, as an adjective. They I, did the same thing. Yeah. When we would be in sessions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not, listen, I'm just codependent. Don't worry about it. Let's worry about you. <laughs> I don't talk about my own problems. It's your problems that are more interesting because I need them. That's how I escape from myself. Uh, I would say, I'd like to say self-aware at the same time. Like, I don't know. Okay. Like, I'm, I'm very concerned with how other people view me. So I... Everything I write, I don't write towards an audience. I write for myself, but mm-hmm. I try to look at myself as if a stranger yeah. or how to appeal. And uh, and I go through some battles with that because I don't think I'm naturally charismatic. I don't feel like uh, uh, I'm the funniest. I just feel like I have to work harder. Really? And then, yeah, I, I always feel like I'm at a negative when I walk on stage for the most part because uh, I feel like people, especially American audiences, are very judgmental. Yeah. So the second you go out there and you don't meet a pre predetermined uh, look or a predetermined or you sound a certain way, then people are going to just assume your character just immediately. Yeah. And I find that uh, that that kind of permeates in my personal life. As it's well. funny because I've, I've, I've seen you perform several times and I've listened to you and none of that comes across to me. And I'm thankful for that. Yeah. I, I think, I think one, it might be my own projection but also, like, my interactions with people, uh-huh. like, like uh, we, for example, uh, most recently we did this uh, uh, at the Velveeta Room. Uh, Pat, Dean, uh, 
did this uh, benefit for uh, uh, illegal immigrants, mm-hmm. uh, the, all the kids in cages that mm-hmm. are in uh, McAllen and all that, uh, except they didn't really advertise it, and no one in the audience really knew what was going on. Oh, God. And I think they barely mentioned it. So it was, and it was during the regular open mic. He just booked a, sh- a showcase with like 23 comics that he liked. Oh, okay. So I prepared all my illegal immigration chunk because I'm excited. <laughs> oh, finally, I can use this where. It's an, got, it's got a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Where people specifically come who are in line with this thinking because I had to write it for people that <laughs> fucking hate that. <laughs> Who one don't want to hear it, don't agree with it, and right. I gotta still like. Well, I'm not gonna fake my point of view. I'm still gonna find a laugh in here because I'm interested in this stuff. Yeah. So I go up there and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna sound like a preachy asshole because no one. It's date night. It's drug tourists. <laughs> it's the people from Esther's Follies who just say the magical musical you just and stumble in. Yeah, I'm gonna come off like some uh, some loud white dude preachers. <laughs> you know. So I'm like, all right, well, I'll just get through the set. And I got through it. It was okay. It was fine. It was nothing special. I didn't feel good about it. Yeah. And afterwards, the comic after me just ripped on me for like two minutes. Like, doesn't he seem like one of the guys that would be for it? <laughs> they're all laughing at me. I'm like, go fuck yourself. Right. You piece of shit. How dare you throw me under the bus? Like, it was in, like I wrote this shit when Bush was talking about building a wall. Right. When I first started comedy and no one would book me because they said, uh, you're too political. Well, and isn't that such an easy, that's such an easy I don't want to say hack thing, but but kind of a hack thing for a comic to do it's, if they no, don't have their own. It, it's it's a hack thing to do, uh, but it's also like a novice thing. That's why I let it go. Yeah. You know? Like I just internalized it. I didn't go up to his face like, you piece of shit. It was like, <laughs> ah, you're just a kid, you know? Okay. And also I'm, I'm very sympathetic when people are getting on stage and they're trying to find who they are. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they're going to be pieces of shit about it or they're going to be snobby. I don't think that necessarily reflects their character i just think that the insecurity that they have on stage is the Mm -hmm. same one i have they just express it different right and sometimes comics after like a couple of years two three years in they still they have a little bit of a set but they still feel the need that they got to separate themselves by dogging on other people yeah to kind of keep them in their confidence to be able to tell the bits the way they need to yeah so i don't it's it's a it's a thing you can't take too personal right yeah they'll figure it out they always do or they quit. I always think about that. You know, I don't want to do somebody else's joke. Do someone else's joke. Bearden talks about you know the night that the stars align and oh, yeah, at yeah. an open mic and someone finally just quits. <laughs> um, so where did you grow up? Uh, well, I was born in Austin okay. and uh, I was raised in San Antonio and okay. I just went back and forth. Uh, mostly San Antonio is like childhood stuff mm-hmm. like that. It was a, uh, it was a hellhole. <laughs> yeah, it feels hotter there for some reason. It's not. I mean, everywhere sucks. Like <laughs> it, it's really easy to like dog on San Antonio, but mm-hmm. like I like I, I appreciate it more now because like I know where everything's still at because nothing's right. changed. Nine eleven hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Don't tell them. It'll really bum them out. Fair enough. Um. There, like, there's a little. It's got actual culture. Like, uh, I grew up. Like, uh, I grew up on the. It, it's weird. I, I, I don't know how to get into this. So I apologize if no. I stumble a little bit. But I grew up on the uh, one side of the tracks up until like nine or ten, and uh-huh. then we moved across the tracks because my dad borrowed a whole bunch of money from my grandmother. Oh wow! But we still laid the same shitty lifestyle. Right. We just did it in a different place that was nicer. So we went from being the 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 white people in the neighborhood that was bringing up the rates or whatever uh-huh. uh, in a mostly Hispanic barrio. Uh, and then we moved to a very white suburban neighborhood, but mm-hmm. clearly didn't belong. Gotcha. <laughs> clearly <laughs> didn't belong with them. Yeah. And by that point they got divorced. So it was like, we were the creepy house in the, mm-hmm. in the middle of the street. Yeah. Yeah. So what was, so you spent most of your early, early years, I'm assuming then in San Antonio then. Yeah. Um, so, do you have any early comedic memories? Oh, like what got me focused on it? Yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. I would say, um, one, I was naturally shy, and I didn't talk to people, and I didn't really have friends. Mm-hmm. And uh, my parents were just, you know, uh, doing hydros. It was like, they were lacing coke with weed, mm-hmm. so they would lock us in our rooms for like a summer, stuff like that. Wow. And uh, feed us. 
underneath the well, there was like a big crack in the door some of it slipped plates and stuff like that really yeah yeah it's 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 really weird thinking back on it like some people get bumped out and when i started saying it, i'm like oh that sounds terrible yeah <laughs> i don't know how to spark this up uh <laughs> <laughs> they uh they I, I remember uh after my dad getting divorced uh there's, there's like three memories that are probably uh, three or four one discovering uh, I, I really loved robin williams live at the met mm-hmm. we had it on vhs when i was a kid and we were just crying laughing watching that I remember napping through Bill Cosby's himself. Mm-hmm. I would, it just always put me to sleep, which is really weird that he's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> as soon as you said that, I was like, oh. No, I just, it, yeah. I know. It, even like in my, like, I, I just remember like, oh, I'd like, I like going to sleep to comedy. Right. And that was the one that would always do it on a relaxing <laughs> summer afternoon <laughs> to drinking cocktails of the old Cos. No, um. <sighs> The uh, and then uh, and then when my dad got divorced, uh, Sam Kinison, Li- uh, Louder Than Hell, he would mm-hmm. play that. Like I'm in third grade, right? But I understood. I, I like the the religious angle and, mm-hmm. and how he and he yelled a lot. And when yeah. you're a kid, that's like, oh, he's great, and said a lot of cuss words. And I grew up saying cuss words like crazy. And then uh, probably around eighth. Eighth grade or seventh grade, maybe sixth, right around middle school age. Mm-hmm. I remember uh, smoking, uh, drinking Sema Red, smoking Marlboro Reds, and walking five miles. I uh, I got these two cassettes with this. Uh, I don't want gambling money. I, work, I went to this private school on scholarship. Mm-hmm. I had no money, and they had a lot of money, so I kept coming up with little scams to get money from them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'd have them bet on games, but against themselves. <laughs> so I'd play the middleman. Right. Uh, but every time they lost... I'm, you were like the house. I, well, yeah. I presume I was the house. That way they would trust it. Right. Yeah. There's just a middleman going through the thing, and nobody knew who they're betting against, so they couldn't narc anybody else out. Gotcha. So it stuck with me. But everybody that won, I would just give them their money back and say, ah, oh, no one bet against you. And everybody that lost, I would just keep the money. <laughs> you were very smart. I made like 500 bucks off Jeez. the Super Bowl. Just off one kid, because mm-hmm. uh, they were like kids walking around thousands of dollars. I hope he's listening. Oh, he's dead. I'm sure he's oh, dead. God. He was. They they all become drug. Uh, all the private school kids that I know they became wild successes, inherited their family's business, but a lot of them just got into drugs mm-hmm. and were the shame of the family. Oh wow! Uh, so I extorted that, uh, <laughs> and I would just buy comedy albums. Okay. Uh, I remember seventh grade. That's right. Seventh grade. Uh, I've never had a good Halloween. And this this puts the kind of the stamp on the seal. I, I really wanted to have a good one. Yeah. And uh, we, well, after school, my dad went drinking, and I was stuck with him, just playing darts at this place called Hills and Dales. And around nine thirty, he was like, "All right, let's take a trick or treating." So he stopped by this Eckerd's, oh. bought a evil clown mask, threw it at me in a black cloak, and then sent me out with a garbage bag at nine thirty. It's already done. Right. Everything's really done. And, uh, so I, I couldn't, I couldn't breathe in the goddamn thing. Mm-hmm. I, I had glasses on. I'm like, that was the worst. Halloween sucked if you had glasses. Yeah. Cause you're just fogging up and this lumpy kid trying to figure it out. So I just, um, I did door to door impressions. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cause I like, I had like a few. So I just asked people just name anybody and I would try and do an impression for candy. Cause I was just that fat and we didn't have food. Oh. So, like, someone say Jack Nicholson, I would just do whatever cheesy Jack Nicholson. Yeah. Someone do Reagan. I was like, all right, I can do Reagan. Bush was popular because of Dana Carvey. Uh-huh. And uh, uh, one person said, do James Earl Jones. <laughs> and I was like, that's a, okay. Uh, so I, I just said, this is CNN. That's all I got. <laughs> that's all I have. That's all I know him from. And then finally, this one lady, uh, she asked, she said, George Carlin. And I had just watched George Carlin's Jammin' in New York, uh-huh. which is still one of my all-time like favorite specials. But I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Right. <laughs> I was like, I can't. You're like, I, you'd have to bleep everything, right? Yeah. So like when she said that, I ended up just getting hardcore into stand-up comedy, mm-hmm. and uh, like I, I went from his first albums all the way up to his later albums, and then did the same with Pryor and anybody else I can get to, to the point where, like around twelve thirteen, I'd take these walks smoking. Uh, drinking these version of Big Red. It's the cheaper Big Red called Seema Red. It was 39 mm-hmm. cents. And uh, I bought Craig Shoemaker's The Love Master. Uh-huh. And Bill Hicks is Relentless. Listen to Craig Shoemaker. I'm like, oh, this is really funny. And then listen to Bill Hicks's. And I'm like, oh, that was not that funny. That Craig Shoemaker was terrible. <laughs> that completely changed my perspective. Right. I mean, I still, there's things to enjoy, but I don't want to yeah. shit on the guy too much. He's doing fine. 
Uh, but that Bill Hicks thing, I remember listening to all of it just like, this is fucking incredible. And then yeah. I vomited all night because I walked way too long and <laughs> smoked way too much and didn't eat. Dehydrated yourself. Yeah. Um, wow. That is... That's amazing. Yeah, it's 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 what I really wanted to do. I always wanted to do comedy, but I never felt like um, I could. Uh-huh. And in San Antonio, there, all we had was like I remember sixteen seeing this like advertisement for the River Center Comedy Club. They had like a comedy workshop taught by this guy named uh, Chris Duell, who mm-hmm. was like the radio guy and the opener guy. And uh, I just I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to go down to comedy school and, and a mall. And I, I remember trying. Mm-hmm. We I would go to the club. It just. I'm not very good about uh, initiating things or acting mm-hmm. on things and like a uh, shyness. So it's like, ah, it's, I don't know. So I, I, I would write, but I would just write what I thought was funny or interesting and then I just learned music. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I figured, I thought I was going to be a musician. And really? Then, yeah. That's, uh, I was telling you earlier, uh, before you hit the record thing, when I was, uh, was 18, 17 or 18, right in that age, uh, my dad threw me out, stole my college money. So all I had was a guitar. Mm-hmm. And a pair of socks and a notebook. I was like, well, I guess I'm going to learn guitar now. Wow, yeah. And just live on the streets and just form a band. That was my way out because yeah. uh, I couldn't go to college because you can't get financial aid until you're 24. You need a parent co-signer. Oh, wow. Like I tried. I tried yeah. multiple times. I tried 10 times to go to college. Uh-huh. Uh, like to, to – like I guess I'll pay this off. I'll get the student loans. Right. And so that scam. And then all 10 times, like twice – uh, like eight times my car broke on the way, right. broke down, like caught on fire in just weird ways. Like I would just get these $800 cars mm-hmm. and then the other two times I got thrown in jail. Uh, backstory. I'm not a criminal. Okay. Uh, I just, uh, I'm also not responsible. So <laughs> like, and I was poor and I was halfway living out of my car, crashing at people's places. So I didn't right. have insurance. And one time I got pulled over. And, uh, I, I got one of those speeding tickets from like, uh, from one of those cameras when mm-hmm. they first came out and yeah, my dad got the mail. I didn't have an address. And instead of like letting it known through the people that right. I have a warrant out for my arrest, he just threw it away. So to my surprise, I get pulled over and get thrown in jail. I'm like, but I'm not a criminal. Right. <laughs> I don't even know what this is for. Yeah. So, uh, got put in the system and, uh, th- there really is a system. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, you know, absolutely. you know the thing. And so in that system, it, it really sucks. Once you got something on your record, then you got to pay it off. That's why I quit. Yeah. Yeah. A year later, like uh, the, the day I got thrown in jail the first time, that was the, the next day I was supposed to go with my friend to go enroll at the community college. Mm-hmm. Uh, a year after that to the date, uh, I had to do like, I had to pay like four thousand mm-hmm. dollars for some. Well, I and like it was originally a thousand hours of community service, but it came down to twenty four, which is pretty steep for having a suspended license slash no insurance yeah. on a running a ticket thing, whatever. Yeah, uh, I told the judge to suck it. I, uh, <laughs> but I negotiated with the prosecutor. Like after talking to the judge, mm-hmm. I just said, "Well, fuck this." I'm like, he got really mad for some reason. Uh, so I went to the prosecutor, uh, like, and acted like that never happened. And he just redid the paperwork. Yeah. Cause I was like, yeah, I'll just plead out here. And, uh, it got, it got brought down. But the problem is none of it covered the original ticket. Yeah. It's one of those rackets where once you get yeah. in that spin cycle, essentially. They fucking it's, got you. It, yeah. Exactly. They, uh, so I, I never got the, they never paid off the ticket. So I still had a warrant. Jesus. So a year later. I'm going to enroll in school. I'm like sleeping in my friend's living room. We're all going together. We get pulled over. I'm pulled out of the car. I'm arrested right in front of my ex-girlfriend's work who just broke up with me for calling me like because I was a loser because I couldn't get it together. Are you like shaking your fist at the heavens at this point going seriously? No, it's funny you say that. Uh, This was after eight times like this whole span of a few years of trying to go to school. I remember being in jail and uh, a year to the date and going, uh, all right, God, if, uh, if you're there. I promise if you get me out of here pretty quick, I'll, I'll never seek higher education. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're never... like, I get it. Fine. Yeah, yeah. What did you want to study? Um, I don't I don't know. St- like, you, you get your associates first, right? You do the courses, the mm-hmm. English, the history, and the, you know, communications. Like, I thought about going to Columbia. I forgot, you know, I just, I'm not good at math. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I looked at schools, but I, I was... You know, one, I was lazy, and two, it was impossible for me to get any type of funding. And uh, three, I was living in living room floors. Like, I don't, I didn't know how to put anything together. Right. Like, I lived an isolated life. So, like, just 
being in society and, and learning how to make friends was new to me because I only had like one or two friends or like a few groups here and there that I would just coast in and out of. But mm-hmm. it was like all through high school, you know how everybody has like their set groups? Right. Well, I, I never had a set group. I would just kind of coast from one to the other mm-hmm. and have like one or two close friends. But at the end of the day, you know, I didn't know how to socialize right. and be around general people because I didn't have like a, a, a regular life. Right. It still carries on today. That foundation was... You need a foundation. Like, you really do. Like, uh, having, like, somewhat of a family foundation and, and, like, having a group thing. Like, I was always alone Mm -hmm. and lonely or uh, in my own head and thinking about a whole bunch of shit that nobody else gave a shit about. Yeah. Especially at that age. Like, I wasn't stupid. Right. It was dumb for other reasons. But, like, uh, like, my mom, like, was teaching me how to be a writer before I could actually write. Okay. She, uh, my first, uh, the books that she would make me read before she went cuckoo in the head was like, she was teaching me uh, Canterbury Tales. Uh huh. I'm learning fucking old English. Right. <laughs> not easy reads. No, even not in, at even all. in high school, let alone. I mean, childhood. the, the yeah. story function is there, but you know, I'm not, you know, there's no reason to pull out Ivanhoe on a child. But that <laughs> right. was her idea was because she spoke five languages and both my parents were apparently genius levels, mm-hmm. just morons. They're all so stupid. Like, I've never had any value in smart people. Right. Because they still do stupid shit. Yep. So, like, that that whole contradiction and not knowing how to relate to people has just kind of permeated. So when you ask me at the very beginning of this, how would you describe yourself? Like, I have no fucking idea. Gotcha. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm t- I, it's because all, all description is based on however people view you. Right. You know, I can't really be the authority on that. Because no matter what I think I am, it's, you know, everybody else kind of dictates what the reality is. Yeah. You know, perception versus whatever. So self-taught musician out of necessity. Yeah. Um, you didn't do the comedy classes, right? No. Um, How did you get into comedy then? How did you make uh, that jump? Comedy classes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a different, it was a workshop. It was. Um, uh, I was young. <laughs> I was, uh, I was 24. 324 uh it was after 911 mm-hmm. it was like 2003 and um my uh I was working at this karaoke job I was hosting this thing called bitter karaoke where it just kind of took a form of its own where I was trying to get fired from this job and in course of getting fired like I would say every terrible thing I could think of to say horrible slash terrible sorry I, I, <laughs> I, you know, I, sometimes I th- I'm sorry if I think too fast. Sometimes no, I combine fine. words and memorizing old shit. Anyways, uh, I would just be funny. Yeah. But I would be funny just ripping people apart. I hated karaoke. I couldn't stand these people. <laughs> I, I worked in this place called Krabby Jacks. It was a seafood themed Hooter style bar. Yeah. Called Krabby Jacks, where all the girls are in bikinis, and they're all like meffed out of their mind here and there. If you pills, some of them best friends of my day, love them to death. But there was a lot of just booze and pills. Yeah. And uh, at that time, I wasn't doing that shit because I was still coming out of the homelessness thing. Right. And I made a deal with myself. I was like, well, I'm going to be homeless, learn guitar, but I'm not doing heroin. Right. I'm not getting stuck in the. Yeah. I I, I haven't deserved drugs yet. Like I grew up around it, so it wasn't like a special thing. Right. Uh, like nine through sixteen, I was like, all right, I'm done. And then when I get my shit together, then I can smoke out and do shrimps and do all that stuff. Right. Uh, so at this, at this bar, I kept trying to get fired. They wouldn't fire me because the sales quadrupled. They went from $2,000 <laughs> nights to $5,000 nights. And they went from two, three n- fights a night to zero fights because I would just have nervous breakdowns, crying on the microphone, just how better I was wow. than this and what have I done with my life. I shouldn't be here. And I'd use this on the mic yeah. while someone's singing like Champagne Supernova or <laughs> whatever, oh, just in the wow. middle of the solo. I would uh, I would play porn behind singers. The girls gone wild and oh, stuff okay. like that if they were really bad. That way the audience is like completely in tune with what's going on, right. laughing. And they're like, oh, I guess they like this. So you made your own personal hell uh – Famous, essentially, like popular. It, uh, it it was actually pretty infamous yeah. uh, in Texas. Uh, like I remember when I was doing comedy, I would do McAllen, Texas, or from McAllen to Dallas to Corpus, I get recognized from this gig. Yeah, people would, at the comedy was like, "Dude, I remember you. You were the crazy guy yelling <laughs> behind a a wall of chairs that you built around yourself to keep the whores out." <laughs> I love that. Oh, it was awesome. It was terrible. But terrible it was, and yeah. awesome. I just, you know, you make the best of it. And yeah. I liked 
you know, and, and, and I'm really good at shitting on people without tr- uh, trying to destroy them either. Right. Like I don't, I genuinely don't have any maliciousness. Right. Uh, and even the people I, I can't stand or despise, I, I still have an affection for. Right. You know, I, I don't want to see any hurt, you know, but I want them to be in on the joke. So I would just make it fun with them. The good natured ball busting. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. Plus Evanescence is terrible. It's garbage music. <laughs> and so she's a fraud using Christianity to sell. And then once, once they start getting the audience and they can shelve their spirituality is that whole creed format. Oh yeah. That was very popular. Just say you're a religious act, and then Christians will buy you because they'll believe in anything. <laughs> Remind me to mention something after this. I, that prompts something. Right. Um, okay, so you ended up in a workshop? Yeah, uh, this guy named Rob Hicks. Mm-hmm. Was, I'm so glad I can remember his name. He was this like 40-year-old dude who uh, in a leather jacket and bald and big mustache. He's like, you got to do this comedy work. He started talking about me, and then I lied to him. I was like, yeah, I totally did that in the past. Because I one, one time I went to L.A. and saw Carlin at the comedy store do a mm-hmm. drop-in set. And that was my, oh, yeah, I once tried comedy once. I was just lying about it. I would do that when I was a kid. I would just lie about the things I really wanted to do. Like right. the only reason I learned guitar was because I told a kid I learned how to play Jimi Hendrix's Are You Experienced? Oh, wow. And then after a while, I was like, well, fuck, I'm a liar. Now I've got to. I have to learn this fucking thing. <laughs> And so I did that with stand-up. I was like, yeah, I did a comedy a couple of times, you know, didn't work out, whatever. And I was totally lying. And then my head was like, fuck, I don't, I don't want to be lied about it. Ah. So you're forcing yourself to live up to the lies. Exactly. That's amazing. Yeah, I don't like, I don't want to be a liar. And you don't want to believe your own lies. That's the other thing. Because what got me, like, through the homeless shit, what I figured out is, one, uh, I, I came up with these rules. Like, uh, one, the first rule is don't bullshit yourself. Okay. You're going to anyways. Yeah. How many people do you know are just bullshitting themselves? Oh, this is acceptable. I'm okay with this. Everything's going good. But, you know, like, no, it's not. Yeah. This is none of this is good. So, like, you're going to do it anyways, but learn how you do it. So, like, if someone, even as innocuous as uh, someone asks you, hey, have you heard of this band? You know, our propensity is uh, is to, to lie and go, oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard of the band. Because mm-hmm. you don't want to seem like you, you're ignorant or don't know something. Right. But who fucking cares? Right. Oh, no, I don't know this band. Please, I would love to hear, what is this band? Tell me about this band. Okay, now I think it's garbage. <laughs> you know, whatever. Now I know. Right. Instead of lying to yourself, just catching that little truth thing in your, excuse me, in your head that tells you when now you're being full of shit. Right. So that was the first rule. The second rule was uh, don't take yourself too seriously. Mm-hmm. Like you got to take yourself somewhat seriously because if you're not, you're bullshitting yourself. Yeah. But if you take yourself too seriously, you're completely bullshitting yourself. No one gives a fuck about you. Chill out a little bit, you know? Uh, allow yourself to, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the third rule was allow, uh, allow, allow yourself to suck. Okay. You're going to fuck up. You're going to fail. But you can't rely on that. You can't always fuck up. You can't always fail because then you're, you're bullshitting yourself and you're never trying to move forward. So you got to take yourself somewhat seriously, not too seriously. You're going to, you're going to fuck up, allow for that to happen and don't bullshit yourself about it. These so, are all great rules for stand up. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of helped me get into the comedy thing. So like, mm-hmm. all right, let's do it. So I took this workshop from this guy named Dave May and Louis Montavo and, uh, Dave was like a structured, like, I guess he was a prop comic when he first started who, oh. Who taught? He was like the improv guy, and yeah. he was teaching stand up. But he was he was a solid stand up. He had some really funny jokes that uh, I can't remember too well. Like uh, his joke that ended up someone else, uh, John Reeb, I think, was doing years later. Was that it's hard to throw away a garbage can. Mm-hmm. It's like he puts it mm-hmm. out in the front and it goes away. Blah blah blah. The other guy, Louis. Uh, I mean, he was always he's always been dying. I think he's still dying. He's been okay. dying for twenty years. Uh, he had. Um, uh, he was like this five foot, uh, Hispanic dude who, uh, his set was all about opening for the Spurs and you might see me on TV and the traffic guy. It was just cheesy jokes, just <laughs> awful. And I took the workshop just like, if I pay to do this, I'm forcing myself to do this. Right. I put money down to do this. I have to do this. Right. I don't have to listen to anybody, but, but you have to I it. have to do the six week course and perform and do the things. And in doing so, I met comic friends and. Like the, 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 as, as, as much as you could be friends with anyone at that time in San Antonio was a miserable scene. Yeah. Just awful. Everybody was like, be a Latino comic and if not have Latino jokes. Uh, and I didn't want to do that. Right. 
I, I didn't want to be a hack. I didn't want to do any of that shit. I was pretty self-aware about like, oh, I want to talk about the war. I want to talk about ideology, the fact that we're shooting ideology. We have a yeah. war on terror. That's, that's a construct idea. You can't have wars on thoughts. Right. We're not marching into terroria, you know, like stuff like that. <laughs> right. Uh, the, uh, so they just suffered through it. <laughs> Because half of my act would, like, oh, this is so, ugh, I don't like remembering this. Okay. Half my act was, like, war on ideology, high construct stuff, uh -huh. uh, having a conversation with God because God's supposed to be inside you, but that's not real. There's your own spirituality. Yeah. Mixed in with the dirtiest, <laughs> horrible shit you can think of and, and like, the most edgelord things you could say. Mm -hmm. Because I would just get mad. I was insecure. Like there'd always be uh, New Yorkers in the crowd and they'd be like, you know, fucking fuck Texas, all pro New York. I'm like, you got your ass kicked by an airplane. And it was just joy to say it. <laughs> all the abortion jokes you can think of, uh, most of which I used for karaoke. And in the bar scene, it worked perfect. Right. In the club scene, half and half. Really? But still, you know, like, like, but still like, uh, like it just, you just, I was just loud and angry yeah. and, and insecure and. I had no nuance. Yeah. So half of it was well thought out intellectual stuff that nobody cared about. And the other half was just the dirtiest possible shit. Do you, so what was your, what was your first open mic? Did, was that part of the, the yeah. class or? Yeah. The first open mic, like the first, I think, I think I did like this one at this place called Uncle Charlie's that was uh, underneath the airport. So just planes are flying by <laughs> where you're doing the shit. And that was me being introduced to the workshop. Mm -hmm. And I just brought out these note cards with, uh, everything I can think of about like, uh, just from the news. Like, uh, uh, one of them was like about the Aust, like the, how much after we were invaded Iraq, I think in 2003, mm -hmm. the big news story was like, Oh my God, but the Oscars are still happening. And so I made a huge thing about that. Yeah. Guys, the war, but, but don't worry. We're going to have the Academy Awards. It's going to be okay. The terrorists are not going to win. Seriously. They're not <laughs> even up for one. It's maybe best director <laughs> for 9-11 or whatever. Uh, whatever. Um, it was, uh, I was a goon. Um, still good jokes. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I stand by a lot. I still like, well, uh, half of them are on my last album. Yeah. Uh, the other half are on the other one. Uh, I just wrote so much mm -hmm. and then doing these mics. I remember the first show show I did in this workshop where I was like, okay, let's do it. Uh, I got fired from my job at karaoke. Uh, they fired me because like this manager was trying to start his own company and he was trying to ice me out and, and drop the sales down and oh, do wow. all this shit. And we got into it. So I started my own karaoke company, but that night I was like, well, fuck it. I guess I'm a comic now. Yeah. And so I started thinking, this is what I'm going to do. Okay. And then did like a this place called Afterburners, which is like by Lackland Air Force Base, uh -huh. and a place where they have brawls all over the bar. Yeah. That type of place. Imagine. It was owned by this big fat guy who was like, "Man, talk about titties." <laughs> just awful, and just all these comics going up that were just ah uh, terrible. And some of the workshop, and one guy was really funny, James Ponce, and uh, I did like seventeen minutes. Yeah. Oh God. And killed <laughs> with terrible stuff. Wow. But like seventeen. But you minutes, read the room and you killed. Yeah, it was. Well, I just did what I wanted to talk about and played and just yeah. let it loose. And they were all like, "Oh, cool! Wow, you were supposed to do four minutes. You did way over your time." <laughs> but they let me go. It was right. like you could do that there. Yeah. Which was like a plus or minus. So it seems like it was like that time in that scene was a both a rough place to cut your teeth, but yeah. also a really. It was San Antonio. The way I say it, it's still like it because they are still. Still unaware 9-11 happened. I'm, I'm, I'm barely kidding about this. Right. But, I mean, the thing about San Antonio was, like, nobody knew there was a comedy club there. Mm -hmm. Like, the people would go there, but it was mostly tourists. But the, you talk to locals, they're like, what? Yeah. It was just not in their day. They didn't give a shit. It was a uh, red box or, you know, mm -hmm. let's go to the movies, let's drink and drink and drink and drink and smoke and then maybe fuck at the end of the night. Right. Um, so in San Antonio, what I, what I noticed was amongst me and a lot of the guys I started with, you had two choices you can go to. Like, uh, like a, a lot of the comics were like, well, I want to work Midland and Odessa. And, uh, so I'm going to write act that would be tailor made for taquietas and bar gigs mm -hmm. and work in this downtown club. And I was like, well, I don't want to do that. I want to talk about this stuff. So I'm just going to have to slug it out. 
at these open mics and, and just created my own. Yeah. Like I started an alt show called That Damn Show. Okay. And uh, where was that? That was at this place called the Cameo Theater, and it was owned by this beautiful old, duh, tired gay man named Jim, mm-hmm. who uh, lived on the third floor of this beautiful historic theater. Mm-hmm. And it was like a it was a huge thing, but he had a little side room, and so I was just like, okay, I'm just going to use my karaoke audience that I built up of right. like 120 people that would come out at any one particular show. Like, divide it up. It'd be, like, 34 or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I would just, once a month, we're going to put on these shows. I'm going to put on the comics I like, and I'm going to do 15 minutes of material uh, that's new every month talking about the jokes I kind of want to talk about. And I feel like – I apologize. Like, I don't mean to asterisk this. No. Um, What kind of really saved my ass for San Antonio was this group called Comedia Go-Go. Uh-huh. They operated out of uh, this punk rock bar called Sam's Burger Joint. Okay. That uh, all like – at that time it was punk, metal, and hardcore. And they did a sketch show and they would let comics open up for them. But all the comics treated it like shit. But the audience was exactly the audience I wanted to talk to. Right. College-age kids, self-aware about what's going on, mm-hmm. who want to hear something different other than, you know, men and women. What? Get out of here. <laughs> Cut it out, you know. Like uh, – and so I would kill at those places and they wouldn't do so good. And then they would shit on the crowd and shit on the thing. I'm like, no, man. This is this is useful. Right. You can get something here. You can you can experiment. You can – like they were a great sketch group. Mm-hmm. And they were doing like big vulgar ideas, clean ideas, film ideas. And they – like I owe a huge debt of gratitude to them for like two years of just being able to do 15 minutes every month new and just record stuff and build – that's incredible that you found. I, I understand what you're saying too, because I, I could see a lot of comedians like it's hard to see like sketch and stand up coexist sometimes in oh, cities. All that stuff coexists well. It's just uh, the the thing that fucked comedy up is just uh, the the improv frauds. Mm. I'm not saying improv, improv frauds. frauds yeah. Like uh, and, and this, uh, like I'll make fun of improv here and there because prevalently it turned in from an artistic medium of expression and, and seeking creativity on stage so you can do character work and sketch work and right. all the other stuff. It turned into a classroom atmosphere of how to make money off Jan from the office who doesn't feel comfortable talking in front of the CEOs right? and doing these workshops and these – like like the Del Close and the uh, L. Ron Hubbard, they were good friends. <laughs> That whole model of Scientology is the exact same model of improv. Gosh. Here's a level. You got to level up. Here's an instructor. He's not certified. He didn't go to improv university that from an accredited <laughs> school. He's just some fucking creep. And now like years of this backlash of everyone like, hey, there's a lot of sexual harassment in the improv community. No shit. Really? <laughs> Get all the creepy kids from theater school that couldn't get it out of their system to get a real job and they want to take it to the workforce. And there's these dream fuckers that you have to go through. <laughs> and some of them are using it for underage, impressionable women who are just trying to follow their dreams. Yeah, it's all fucking gross. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's kind of fucked things a little bit. Like that, because the audience is kind of different too. Man, this is, I'm sorry, I'm mixing no, everything. No, no, it's great though. No, because I like the way you just diagrammed out what has been going on in that scene for a while. Yeah, well, I mean, that was going on the scene. And then also those same frauds were like trying to do stand up and some of them, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Holy shit, unbelievable. And when it comes to getting actual parts and, and doing films and stuff, you, you need improvisers. Right. Stand ups are shitty actors. Yeah. They're, well. they're good writers, but they're, you're not going to talk. Andy Daly, uh, Andy, uh, Andy Daly or, uh, Matt Besser or a lot of these cats that are just like, or, uh, 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 Amy Poehler, uh, 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 uh what's, uh, Sedaris, what's her name? Amy. Amy Sedaris. Oh, she's incredible. Mm-hmm. Like, but they're incredible because they can just let go and they don't have that self-awareness. Right. They just get into the character. Whereas stand-ups, we get up there and we're auditioning like, none of this is real. <laughs> and then all the insecurities come up. I'm not used to this. I'm not in control. You know, we just. Yeah. We're little bitches. <laughs> I'm not saying one's better than the other. I'm just saying that, right. that that whole classroom atmosphere and then and then seeing stand up shows go, Hey, come out and see stand up you know, in front of the sketch group and we're just gonna do comedy turn into you know, let's just make stand ups get drunk and make them spin around in circles and then use their first notes and then the audience will throw stuff out. Like it turned into game shows. Yeah. 
and everyone's trying to come up with their weird, wacky stand-up show, and it, it, it's kind of changed the way audiences. It's like we're trying to trick audiences to just watch comedy, right? Because they're like, I don't want to see stand-up, <laughs> because there's a lot of shitty stand-ups too. It's like it's the whole world, the whole thing. It's like, yeah. Sorry, it's it's um, it's overwhelming. I can see that. If I, if I was writing this down, it'd be a lot easier to phrase this and put it here and here and here. And it'll be this long, drawn out thing. No, but, but like, I'm talking fo- about I'm it, I get 20 thoughts at once. I'm following the art. Um, but I am going to bring it back to you. Okay. Um, so, as part of getting in front of this sketch group and getting time with an audience you felt more attuned to, um, where did you go from there? Um, well, like I put on my own shows. Uh, I met this one producer guy who got me to write a script uh, that he ended up selling, and I think he kept way most of the money. I found out years later, I was like, you got, you got two grand for this script you wrote? And I was like, yeah. Uh, people usually get 10 to 15. <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, all right. Oopsie. Um, the, uh, yeah, I just, I, I kept doing the independent stuff, but at the same time, I still wanted to work the clubs mm-hmm. because that's 80% of the comedy. Right. And so I, I developed like a club act, which was a little safer. And it was not safer. I don't know how to, a little more easily digestible, not so heavy handed on the, on the subjects. And I just focused on uh, women like cute panties when they're going to put out or whatever <laughs> stupid shit. Men just have holes in their underwear, you know, like yeah. that stupid thing. And uh, I can't even, I can't even think of those jokes anymore. <laughs> I really can't even think, but it, like uh, they were necessary for the yeah, time. And the you place. needed a fifteen-minute set to be an opener, and they they took forever to put me up to opener because like, oh, you might be too dirty. But when they finally did it, I kept killing. Yeah. Or excuse me, I kept doing well as an opener, doing my job. People were laughing. I owned the stage, and they were like, "Well, all right, let's bump it a feature." And I was like, ah, "I'm not ready for feature yet." And then I learned uh, later on, I would work with a few acts that I trusted. I was like, hey, let me feature for you. Yeah. So I know I'm not going to fuck up the show because I still care about that. Well, you are self-aware. Yeah. So <laughs> I would take like, wow. 15 minutes from the alt shows and yeah. 15 minutes from that club. And I would try to marry them together mm-hmm. so that I can at least save any joke or any premise that went off into a dark or deeper kind of place that lost the audience. I still had material to kind of bring it out of it. So... After a while of doing that and just starting to feature more, I learned, I, oh, I don't need those opener jokes anymore. I can actually just make this stuff funny yeah. and also more palatable or more universal uh, and less Bill – like I, I hate that Bill Maher smugness. Mm-hmm. Like you don't want to go up on stage and act like you're better than everyone. Right. And, and I mean that's very popular now. There's like that hero type of comedy where like you say basic facts that we all agree with as if – you're speaking God's truth to power. Yeah. Like my favorites in comics go, I was like, guys, I don't know. I just think beating women is wrong. And that's the joke. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, yeah. You have, I've noticed this, and if you don't mind me saying, you have a way of throwing out an almost cringing topic and then helping an audience walk it back and explain. Please give me an example because I don't even think of it that way. You don't? No. I I don't know. I was listening. You know, I, I've I've seen you perform, and I've listened. I listen to your albums, and it's just you'll go into these subjects that are heavy and hard and and difficult. For example, oh, abortion. Okay. I don't... Or um, I'm trying to think of another one. Um, but you'll 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 hit okay, a topic. Okay, okay, yeah, no, I can I can riff on that. And then you will kind of walk it back with the audience and give them a perspective. Like you'll make them pull back with you and say, "Now look at it this way." Yeah. And it it takes a topic that would be like, "Oof," and then makes people go, "Oh." I uh I I, I want to say like instinctively, I'm I'm a I'm a rascal. <laughs> No, a rap, I don't see a little that. Little rascal, I can't me. believe it. A little it. playful. I like, I like those topics. Right. I love. I'm. I've always been interested in tab. What's considered taboo? Because right. I don't see lines, and I think everything should be discussed and in, interested. In, and uh, I can see why that's annoying. Absolutely. So I don't just do it in my private life all the time. Mm-hmm. I, I try to back off from it. But that's the shit I'm interested in. Like, uh, like I don't want to be like the white splainer. 
Like I, right. I know it's totally annoying to have some dude try and explain things to you. Yeah. That's even if they're correct, it's just it's who are you rewarding? Yeah. Like uh, anytime you have a conversation, like I, I really stick to this with comedy. Comedy, I try to put a comedy ahead of my ego. Because mm-hmm. anytime you talk out of your ego, your comedy stays below that and you don't really move forward. Right. But if you focus on your comedy, your comedy gets better and it drags your ego with it. Same with regular conversations. Like if we're going to talk about a subject like abortion, mm-hmm. I have a limited uh, knowledge of it. Uh, of course, because I can't have one, right? but I can empathize with it and I can understand there's other perspectives and other points of views. And I'm totally down to explore that, but I don't attach my ego to it. Like I need to be right. Yeah. Because when you start needing to be right, then you're talking over people and you're not listening to what they're saying and, 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 and responding to it. Mm-hmm. Like too many conversations are just one person talking at the other person yeah. and just hit a wall. And I, I can't stand that. Yeah. However, that's how most people talk. So I end up not talking to most people <laughs> like, uh, like for an abortion thing, like, uh, the joke I've been doing, I did this in uh Plano when I was headlining the hyenas up there this last Saturday, they, uh, the audience got like, they, they like, I think most audiences are just prepared to go, Whoa. Right. And it's nothing. It's enough. No one was hurt. Right. They're just words, but I understand why you need to they feel, feel that. They feel obligated to pull back a little. Yeah, they need on to these feel. Words. Yeah, or or you know maybe they had one. I don't know. Right. <laughs> like there's that a- aspect to it. But usually people that have one aren't like, hey, hold on, buddy. They're usually <laughs> very quiet and they cry softly to themselves, <laughs> the way the good Lord intended, right. in their shame. Uh, <laughs> the joke is basically it's like uh, how like we're told not to talk to each other. And now people are trying to be political and people are despising it. It's like, no, stop talking about it. But like on first dates, they told me never to talk about politics, religion, and abortion. But those are the only things I think you should talk about on a first date. Yeah. Why would this, why would we, why are we using all this surface conversation? Like I dated, listen, this joke comes from the fact that I once dated a racist accidentally. Oh. And I didn't know she was racist until she met my black friend. Oh, shit. And this is a joke I don't do on stage. There's just, I don't know how to make it really funny, but it was very awkward when yeah. her first, like when she met him and he went up to the bathroom to get some stuff. She looks at me, he's black. And I'm like, holy shit, why aren't we just talking about all this on the first date? Oh, my God. I need to get this out of the way. Because, I mean, I'm already having sex with her. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's so, like, so I'm talking about it. It's like, you should talk about politics. You should talk about religion. You should talk about abortion on first date because you're going to want to know at the end of the night if the condom breaks. Right. Are you at 500 bucks or 18 years? <laughs> simple joke. Simple. Doesn't pick a side. Doesn't tell you how you should feel or think, but everybody just projects on there. I was like, oh, I was like, no, no, fuck you. Anyone can laugh at that. If you're pro-life or pro-choice, all I did was present the options. Right. But then you jump into another relatable topic that yeah. everyone can get on board with, and you make these analogies. That's part of the walking it back. You make these amazing analogies in life that make people make that jump from, oh, I can't relate to that, to, oh, I get where he's going with yeah. that. Well, so- sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Like the one, the one I... Because the traffic thing that oh, you go yeah, to yeah. next in yeah. that joke. There's... A... <sighs> The, the 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 bit I I didn't put on the album that I really wanted to, uh-huh. but it just one it wasn't strong enough, and also it was just out of place. But it was I worked really hard on it, and it came together pretty quick. And it was just defending Woody Allen. Oh yeah. And it's not I'm not defending Woody Allen for the allegations that I don't know about. I'm right. just defending his marriage to Soon Yi. Okay. Because everyone calls that like this horrible, creepy thing. So when you think about it, you're like, for years, for over a decade, I've been like, oh, Woody Allen, what a fucking pedophile. Right. What a creep. But this Asian fetish pedophile fetishizing a culture. And then like there's his daughter and yeah. he's fucking his daughter, you know, and, and, and in that headspace, you know, you just dismiss it. But if you really think about it, one, Sunni's not his daughter. No. All right. It's not even his adopted daughter. Right. Like, and if you were explaining it to someone, you're like, uh, so I was like, well, he, he didn't, it's not it's his adopted. Like if someone said Woody Allen's fucking his daughter, you would be like, that's disgusting. And they right. said, hold on, she's adopted. And then you're like, well, it's not, it's not as bad. Right. <laughs> but it's still pretty bad. It was like, well, he didn't adopt her. It's from a previous marriage. Okay. All right. No, no initial relationship with her at all. He yeah. didn't pick her out. <laughs> Just mm, that one, you know, like 
whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm thinking the one in the middle with the, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> she'll, she'll get on the clarinet or whatever. Uh, he, uh, like, you go back into it. She was like, just the odds, like, soon you to me is amazing that uh, she was, she was an orphan in Korea. Mm-hmm. And then some famous, famous Hollywood actress just shows up and picks her out. That's like the dream. That's Annie. Right. That's the dream. Every orphan has a dream of a rich, famous actress picking them out and loving them. And mm-hmm. then that family falls apart. And then Woody kind of comes into the picture and they get married. But he's not a father. You know, he's a director. He's just doing his own thing. And then years later, they hook up and get married. And the whole point of the joke is basically Woody Allen isn't even her worst father. <laughs> she had to get through two of them. That's true. Yeah. So it, it is a truth. Now, the reality is. Woody Allen's probably a giant piece of shit. And there's that whole, uh, uh, the, the Ronan Farrow article and the stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So like as much as I think, okay, one, that joke's funny. I like how I defend a terrible thing and make it not so bad. And also they've been married for 20 fucking years. She got married to him at 26. She had plenty of time to change her mind right. and go, maybe this old Jewish guy isn't for me. <laughs> Clearly she's into it. And they've been married longer than most of the people who've been yelling about it are alive. True. A lot of these kids are like, fuck Woody Allen. They're like, yeah, their marriage has lasted longer than you. So, like, I mean, those aspects are true, but there is a seedier side. There's that, the other allegations. So, like, to me, I wasn't too comfortable. You still can't make it palatable even to yourself. Well. To feel confident in it. It's easy. Like, I love making the shittiest easy jokes. I really do. Even even the hardest shittiest jokes. Like, like the, the wrongness of something is mm-hmm. just as funny as the rightness. And I know it's very popular right now to be all about be as most right you can be, but most of that shit ain't funny and it's not long lasting. Right. It's not a challenge. I would like to make a right out of a wrong and let everyone know, hey, we're just yucks. We're just having a good... Mm-hmm. It's fun to have fun. None of this is serious. I don't care about Woody Allen and Soon Yi. Right. And I doubt anyone else really does either. It's not really a part of their day. Right. Like no one in Texas is waking up like, God damn that Jew son of a bitch. <laughs> Stealing our fine Asian women. Like no one's really emotionally invested. I like to but... imagine there is one guy oh, out yeah. there that's <laughs> just every day. I would treat her like a woman or whatever. <laughs> just... just hate watching Annie Hall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like there's there I mean there those people exist but I don't think I don't think that's real either yeah. like this whole this whole culture of uh caring about shit mm-hmm. to its excessive form and I mean the term is I hate oh, this is sucks because everything that's going on today it, it has this baggage and it's not the emotional baggage of what people are going to think about how you feel about something mm-hmm. it's this emotional baggage that carries weight with uh jargon and the the token words that get thrown about as if you're having a conversation. I think that comes out of hashtagery. It is absolutely hashtagery, and it's also something that... Is hashtagery even a word? Uh, probably. I should hashtag. Hashtag the word, and it's now going to be in the, the lexicon. The vernacular, yeah. But I, I, I think what happens is, like, no one really thinks about this shit. And no one... Because no one really is actively interested in it. So it's easier to just hear a bunch of people's thoughts and just assume them as your own. You'll see this with, uh, uh, like, a lot of dudes will get on Reddit, and then suddenly they have that point of view. They well, didn't our actually... attention spans are so short. I don't think our attention spans are so short. I just don't think there's that much to really worry about. Like, like who gives a shit? So we're just filling it with millions of time. Like, uh, I don't know. I'm still exploring that idea, but I, I don't have the time to think about it or the attention. <laughs> like, I don't want to say virtue signaling. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people are virtue signaling. To me, it's their branding. They're like their lifestyle brand. And like, I always got to be on brand or I always got to be the most correct because I don't want people to assume this about my character. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of what few problems I have with people is because they, because I'll take a step back and like, let's look at this. Let's think about it. It's easier to write me off as a piece of shit who's probably in this camp than it is to go, wait, 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 no, you know. Like I'm trying to, I'm trying to. Think. I just did a podcast with uh, my buddy Jake Flores. Mm-hmm. He's got a great podcast, Pod Damn America. It's fantastic. I'll give you a little cross promotion. <laughs> if this matters. Um, we were talking about the Chris Hardwick case. Oh yeah. And uh, like, like their their stances. He's a piece of shit. Clearly a rapist. Clearly he needs to be out of work and all that other stuff. And mine was like more conflicted i was like well let's let's get into it like that's too easy to say because one he, he wasn't accused of rape 
Right. He was accused of being a shitty boyfriend. I don't think he's a good dude. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't want to defend him either. But also, like uh, one of their one of the, one of their main points was he's rich. He shouldn't have to work ever again. But that doesn't give you value as a human being. You want to do. You want to work and right. put yourself out there. And even if it's meaningless, trite bullshit like hosting shitty shows, like that's a person's right. Like is, is someone being a bad boyfriend who is mean and, and self-involved and narcissist and probably emotionally abusive because of that, out of that narcissism, do they deserve shows? No, no one deserves any of it. Yeah. So like, I'm trying to think about it. It's like, do I want to have a job? Do I want to see it? Like, I don't watch the shows in the first place. Right. And then the person that's, that's upset about it. I'm like, why, why the fuck didn't you leave? I was like, you don't understand being trapped in an emotional relationship. I'm like, yeah, I do. I've been in, I was one in for nine years. I totally get it, but I didn't go around crying about it. And I don't blame, I, I can only blame myself. Yeah. So it's like, and so I'm like analyzing, I'm looking at these two people and I'm like looking for the boat. And then I realized, oh, I don't give a fuck about either one right. of them. I, that was my night. That's where this I was. This is none of my business. I was like, what? We don't always have to have the, as I like to say, we don't always have to have the hot take. No. I mean, comedy, you kind of want to just be right. to riff and For get ready. Work. But like even the hot take should – my hot take is who I don't give a shit about either one of these people. Right. I don't care that she feels like she can't cosplay anymore professionally because I don't believe in that. that. <laughs> yeah, She's a cosplayer and he's a fucking nerd and they both suck and they're both <laughs> fucking trying to attain fame in this thing that nobody deserves. They're both narcissists to me. They're both shits. Fuck them all. <laughs> Why do I care? You don't want to be in a shitty relationship? Get the fuck out. I know it's hard. Yeah. I know it's uh, there's weight, and I know all that stuff. I've gone through that. But also, fucking handle your own shit. Before crying online, let everybody fight your own battles. <laughs> and that's not even the whole take. That's just me now it's projecting just, yeah. on top of it. So, like, there's all those things you got to negotiate. But people, you're... you're it's, you don't want to hyper-focus on what other people are going to perceive because other people are like, oh, well, I guess he thinks all rapists should have jobs. <laughs> or, I guess he's not an ally of women. It's like, not all of them. <laughs> no, I've dated a lot of pieces of shit. There's, a, there's, a, there's that aspect to it like, um, like, uh, that I like to explore and think about, like, uh, like white girl feminism, mm -hmm. you know, like a privileged white girl feminism. Like most of the people that are screaming about privilege – are people that come from actual privilege right. and they are very guilty about it. Yeah. <laughs> and so they need to ascribe their self-awareness so that they can still seem like they're better than their actual privilege. It's kind of like that thing my dad used to do. My dad used to do this thing. Uh, it was the do as I say, not as I do. Mm -hmm. uh, learn from my bad examples. Don't do what I do. Right. And I was like, oh, that's just you trying to sound smart, even though you know you're fucking up. Right. You should probably stop fucking up. <laughs> That's not wisdom. Lot, lots of opinions and wisdom to impart with very little to nothing, back it up. Nothing to back it up. And, and you see that in other aspects to it. Like, yeah. uh, like, uh, like uh, my favorite is just you bring up black women in a feminist argument and then it completely – like everything <laughs> changes and scoped and then everyone's trying to out-virtue the other <laughs> and, no, I'm here for you. It's like, bitch, I don't need your help. And it's just fun to watch <laughs> this whole dynamic fall apart and you're like, oh, that's right. No one's a spokesman for shit. Right. Like everyone's like uh, trying to be a spokesman for their whole entire group and it's it must be exhausting. Yeah. Like I can only talk for myself. Yeah. It, it's when I when I start to see people speak in generalizations, I'm I kind of start to tune out. Dude, that's all I've been thinking about for like two weeks now is because I mean, how do we do it? I know I do it. Yeah, I do. I know I, uh, generalizations are part of conversation and it's part of human thinking. At some point, we only have so much room in our head for so many different things or different people right. that we're going to generalize. And biologically, we group things for safety. You know, the, our lizard brain will group things for safety's sake and things like that. But well, to an example, like, it, or not that that shouldn't be challenged either, because mm -hmm. like that's one thing that I love. Like the the I would love to explore trans issues. Mm -hmm. And how I feel about it and how I felt about it before to, to now and how, how that, how this information changes how you think, because I feel like a lot of people are coming to this in the same way. Uh, I'm interested in, I never, this is weird to me, but I never really considered gender and biology separate fucking things. Right. I didn't really take biology. I didn't pay attention. Biologists have known about trans issues for decades, forever. Like they've been the front runners. Like, oh yeah, it's a spectrum. Mm. <laughs> it's in the it's in the in nature. 
it's absolutely a spectrum in so many different actions. Mm -hmm. But for me growing up, I was just raised boy, girl, and then liars. <laughs> so like, uh, I mean, I had, I had friends who were, who were uh, um, drag queens and I had friends who were trans, but I didn't understand the mentality of, of someone who had gender dysphoria or uh, someone who just wants to, oh, I, I go by, the, I'm biologically this, but I'm gender this, and I choose right. to go by this. And like wrapping your head around that after years of thinking one way, it, it, it's it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Because it's a, great, it's a great opportunity to be wrong about something mm -hmm. and then grow from it and then change the way you think and, and learn how to think about people as more than just one or two things. Yeah. Like when you see someone, you generalize them. You really do. Like a stranger, you generalize a stranger and you put them in a camp because you don't know this person. Right. You have no idea who they are. So what I like is you, you, by that gender versus biology thing, you've added an extra layer. So you've got to think about people as more than just one simple generalization. Right. Maybe two simple generalizations. Yeah. I'll give you two. <laughs> so I'm going to walk us back again. Back. All right. Sorry. I'm going to go on a lot no, of no, tangents. You're fine. You're fine. Um, How did you get to Austin? I know you've I took been 35, back and forth. I took 35 north. <laughs> uh, a lot of traffic, but, you know, you go at night, it's easier. I, um, well, I mean, I always had a connection here because when I played in bands, like I, I played in uh, – my brother lived on Old Torf, so I'd just mm -hmm. go back and forth, crash with him, play six and whatever carousel club or whatever shows, like through my teenage years. But in comedy, I was always the San Antonio guy because mm -hmm. that's, that's your label where you start. That's right. what you're going to get. So about – Seven years ago, I was crashing back and forth. I would go up, uh, I started getting feature work in Dallas and Houston. So on my drives through here to Dallas or Fort Worth, I would stop and crash at Joe Stats's place. Mm -hmm. And then I would do Cap City's open mic and just try to be a presence. But you really have to live here to do it. So that first moon tower, I had a free pass like, uh, 2012. I was already moving here, but I had a free pass of, um, like a media pass because I was writing for an alt weekly and just going on and doing all the things and seeing the comics that I already worked with in other places and hanging out with friends. I was like, Oh yeah. Like this is the club where they're actually trying to bring industry and mm -hmm. do things with. And, uh, I should probably move here because it's a challenge. Right. Uh, you get more stage time. And also I'm used to long form comedy because in San Antonio you can get 20 minutes pretty quick. Right. However, most of those 20 minute sets suck because you're filling it with nonsense. <clears throat> Whereas here, it's more focused on three minute sets, four minute sets, showcase sets. So you have to condense, get to the idea. It's a different language of comedy that I didn't know. Yeah. And to go to New York and LA, you have to learn that language in Austin. You gotcha. really do. And a lot of people don't realize that. And I think some people take it for granted, but it's something that I've never been good at. So I moved here specifically to go, well, I can't move to those places unless I do that. Of course, now I found out later it doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> uh, but it was it was really valuable. I moved up to Austin specifically to learn how to do three four minute sets and and, and then construct what is a showcase set. Yeah. Because that was their focus. Their contests are all how do you do an arc in that five minutes? Mm -hmm. So I, I would study Conan sets when people go up on Conan, just watch that and uh, Tonight Show sets and just seeing how people do you know, one joke to the other joke to the other joke. What's their poise like and. Uh, try to bastardize my own version of it, mm -hmm. which didn't really, doesn't really feel right. <laughs> Still doesn't feel right. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I don't agree. Oh, I, I mean, I, I, I don't feel like it. Okay. Like whatever appearances is just experience and having jokes, Gotcha. but there's still like, there's man, there's, when you see people that know what the fuck they're doing and naturally have it, mm -hmm. you can tell like what you're missing. And so I always try to be around those people. Yeah. Like uh, my buddy Raul Sanchez mm -hmm. inherently knows how to do that. He like has a mind for it and he can arc it and do it. He's got the poise. Yeah. He knows how to fail. And like, it's, it's like learning. I'm trying to remember who else said it. Bill Burr said it like fail with grace. Right. I've never been able to do that. Really? I, I always ref like you. All right. You're not going to like me. Well, you're going to fucking remember me. And that would go off on these horrible tangents. Yeah. Not a good thing. Not the best thing. You you should be able to stand by your jokes and let them fail so you either write them better or learn how to communicate them better. Do you remember the first time you bombed? Like really felt that you bombed? I mean, I'll let you know when it happens. No, <laughs> it happens all the time. Um, bombed? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember it was at River Center Comedy Club. It was this dude named Jesse Pangeline and Showcase Set. 
it was the first time I met him and he was trying to bully me and I just made fun of him because he was like a bad bully because he got bullied like hardcore by the Latino scene. Uh-huh. And uh, I went and did a show and just they stared at me for 12 minutes, gave me nothing. I don't remember how much it hurt. And that was pretty bad. And then there was one when I moved up here. It was after the Velve, and I had to drive back to San Antonio to pick up some stuff. Ugh, and it was, drive. Yeah, but it was right after bombing. And right, just, that's like, what I mean. Tearing that up in the car, drive. tearing up in my goddamn truck, just like, God damn it, if I can't get this shit to work, right? What the fuck am I doing with my life? And uh, there's there's been a, there's been not that many. So how do you rebound for this? If you if you're because I guess what I'm saying is you just said, like, when things aren't landing and you, you don't feel like you, you'll yeah, that's, fail, fall with grace and then you have a bomb set, how how do you recover from that? Yeah, those are devastating bombs where you're just, like, <laughs> that cough in the back of the room and you're like, mm-hmm. oh, this sucks. I'm not – I can't do this. Those have been few and far between. The other sets that are just not good mm-hmm. is just when uh, when you're not prepared or gotcha. you don't know what you're talking about. And, uh, or you haven't really thought of the joke. You're too in love with the idea. And, and that's where I'm at right now. It, I, I, you're going to be, anyone that's listening to this that does comedy, like you, you get your set and then that's your set and then you have your set for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. Or you get your set and you record your set and then it's done and you're like, oh shit, I got to do it again. Yeah. I learned this from, uh, going to Stan Hope's house, uh, for his Super Bowl parties. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, he, uh, I got to crash in his room one year. And he was just surrounded by his notebooks and stuff. And I just looked at him seeing how he's like his mindset. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, fuck, he's writing almost perfect jokes on one page. Just one blocked out joke. You're like, yeah. but he thinks it's shit. So you're like, ah, oh, fuck. And then talking to him, he was like, it's over. He's, he's retired. Every album he puts out, he retires. He's like, I'm done. It's over for me. Yeah. And then I realized watching that, I was like, oh, that's how it is. It's cyclical. Every, just because he got that hour doesn't mean you're, it's, it's over. It's done. Right. And then you got to do that whole process again, which again. means you get the whole insecurity and the whole thing. And, and that's what I'm facing now. Like, I got like 20 minutes of new shit that I think is garbage. Well, because you put out Monster Ballads came out this year, yeah. correct? And what, when did it come out specifically? Is it recent, recent? Uh, April 12th. Okay. It was actually. So not too far out. Yeah, it was two years after the first one. Okay. And I waited a year to sell that, to push that one out. So I had like a, I had hours of material. Right. That was okay. Or worked out, but when you say hours of material, it doesn't mean it's set worthy. Right. So what I did is like for the first album, I recorded like I, I did the hour when I when I recorded the hour, half of the material was stuff that I had written the previous ten years, and the other half was the stuff I'd written the past year, six months, mm-hmm. and just mixed it to so it'd be fresh. Half would be fresh, half would be worked out, and it'd be a little looser, and it wouldn't be it would be more relevant. Right. And then this last album, I took the other half, like I did a like 30 minutes on religion that I wrote my first year in comedy and then refined. And then the other half was stuff that I wrote the past two years or past year, two years, uh, after high and lonesome. So I could have like that same feeling like mm-hmm. it's like fresh. And then this only that one was a really bitch to record because, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I ended up having an atheist convention come in. They were like this atheist group comes in. And that saved the whole album. Oh, wow. Yeah, it, it legit saved the album. Wow. Because th- there's some material in there that I forgot how harsh it was, and I didn't say it right the first show. Oh. So the audience just staring at me like, that is the worst fucking thing I've ever heard in my life. Really? And they were right. Because <laughs> I didn't present it right. It was gotcha. that whole, uh, no, I don't even want to say. <laughs> I don't even want to say. Gotcha. Um, so where are you at right now? Uh, right now I'm trying to figure out what the fuck this industry is. Okay. Everything's changed. Yeah. It's Everything's like, different. I think, I think you're not alone in that. I know I'm not alone. I think everyone feels that way, but I, it's what is going on? How are things changing? I mean, it's, it's prevailing. I like to think of, ahead of the trends and try to be at least prepared. Yeah. So I'm not a mental wreck. Like, right. why isn't everything just working out for me naturally? Cause it never has. Right. Um, for example, like the model when I first started comedy was, you know, get a hosting work, get a feature work, become a headliner, get attention from networks, you'll travel, you'll tour, hopefully you get some TV time, and then maybe you can work out some deals or getting a writing a job. Yeah. Now it's completely wide open as far as, uh, but it's it's more tastemakers are changing everything. You have a lot more uh, 24-year-old interns who can afford to live in New York and L.A. because their parents pay for everything. 
So they're mm-hmm. interning at the networks and then they become the tastemakers and they decide what goes forward. Right. Uh, sometimes they're right on the spot and then other times it's, ugh, I don't like it. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't do that. Uh, for example, uh, I know a lot of comics are really sad that they're white male comics right now. I don't know if you heard this on the, I don't know if this is a prevalent thing in your interview. No, I've, I, I know what you're talking about. But there's but, yeah. a lot of straight white male comics bitching that nobody cares about their point of view. Yes. And it's true to an extent. Uh, like I have friends in L.A. and New York right now who are getting told the same thing from uh, from the management and agencies and what I was like, yeah, can you be a straight black gay man? Or can you be a gay black man or mm-hmm. a, a lesbian or anything other? Than, we're just We're not looking for straight white male voices right now. And they're miserable. They're crying about it. They're closet pissed, you know, because they can't openly express it. Right. Because, you know, there is that whole decades where everything was great for them. Right. <laughs> and that kind of bad. You're like, oh, I did it at the wrong time. Uh, so when they're crying about it, I just kind of look at them. I'm like, I'm, I've never been what anyone's ever been looking for. So I, I'm, I'm not unhappy at all. Right. I have no expectations of success from this. <laughs> I know I didn't go into this thinking that I would be the star of a vehicle or mm-hmm. be on TV or a movie or be uh, anyone worth listening to. I, I'm a fucking bum. I was homeless playing guitar. I'm just trying to keep it going forward. <laughs> I like this. This is what I want to do. And right. I'm painting myself in a corner that the older I get, the less healthy I get, the more fucked I'm going to be. Okay, here we go. <laughs> That's all I've grown up around. So none of this is a surprise. So like I'm not going to L.A. or New York thinking that I'm going to take this town because I'm not what anyone's ever been looking for. Gotcha. So I'm, I'm, I, I don't, I'm not upset. But at the same time, like I was in New York uh, this last week and I'm looking at – I was on the Brooklyn – this Brooklyn Park and uh, my friend took me out and we were watching the uh, – we're watching you know, Manhattan, the law and order scene, basically. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, you get that feeling like, oh, I'm going to take this fucking town. Because uh, that scene really gets into your ego. It really, your, it's, your ego is attracted to New York. You see mm-hmm. the big man, and you're like, and all the things that come with it and all the opportunities. And then I realized I'm not a fucking banker. <laughs> Most of that shit's bankers. And the right. market, like, that's money. I'm not in that league. So all these comics are going over there. Everyone I talk to, they're all fucking struggling. Yeah. My buddy Jake lives in a weird art house that's run by the Foot Clan from Ninja Turtles. <laughs> it's like they're, they're all struggling. And then people that I know that are doing regular host week at Gotham, they're miserable because they can't really do clubs and they don't know where they're going. And I keep hearing the same stories. I'm like, oh, that's because everyone is trying to put their life and their career in the hands of other people and expect it to work out. Right. I really think uh, it's about your own work ethic and what you create that'll propel you forward. If you're good enough, you're going to get JFL. Yeah. It doesn't matter your color of your skin. It doesn't matter how old you are. It does to an extent what they're looking for, but if you're that good, you get over that. Now, the fact is it's widely oversaturated and there's all these different voices and different niches in comedy. So the likelihood of someone like Andy Huggins, for example, from Houston getting Mm -hmm. JFL is a little, New faces. It's a little. It's a little dim for him. Right. But he just got America's, uh, got, got talent. talent. Yeah. M- killed it. Murdered it. Mm-hmm. And that's just he's putting the steady work. And also, oh, we need a funny old man. Yeah. Let's put a funny dying old man out there, in his house shoes. <laughs> and you know what? He's fucking worked his ass off and yeah, he he stayed is. doing the work. He's continuously writing new jokes. So when, when they called it up, he did a set and he was ready for it. He's amazing. So it's like what I'm trying to figure out is like, well, if I'm not what anybody's looking for, I, don't, I feel bad bothering them about it. <laughs> you know, I don't want to do that. Uh, I gotta, I'm just going to write the things that I find funny and interesting. And, and uh, I, I, I want to learn how to do some animation stuff and I want to write. I guess books more and mm-hmm. just create as much as possible and stay, try to focus on the positive. And I don't know. I, I really think it's going to come down to uh, the next thing for this industry is just collectives. Yeah. Um, I can see that. I really think comics need to work together more and create their things. Like uh, this group out of Denver called the Grawlix did a great job of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, all of them ended up getting TV spots. They on they had their own uh, TV show they're doing stand up traveling and it all came from them being in Denver working together to build up an audience and, and constantly writing sketches and content and having stand ups do their shows and work together and 
I think that's a good model. Yeah. You, uh, it's the same thing with music. Like, uh, I have the benefit of starting in music. I feel like comedy is always 10 years behind the trends in music. Mm-hmm. So, like, as... Oh, mu- that's interesting. Yeah, I yeah. could see that. As music became... Anybody, like, home software and everything like that, more people are doing music, so it created all these different niches and albums. But the same, at the end of the day, the people, the top names, they own everything. Yeah. The labels own everything, and now they own Spotify. But you can still have a career doing it, but then you have to set up your own merch. Right. Uh, you know, like that. So now stand-ups are kind of figuring out, like, well, I can pursue more fringe festivals. Mm-hmm. I can do a one-hour show. I think the British model is going to come into it more now that Netflix is going more global. Mm-hmm. And they're bringing more awareness to British comedy. So I think it's going to change the way we perceive comedy. Like that Nanette special that came out, that Hannah Gatsby that everyone's just really mad about. Mm. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. A lot of people are furious. Yeah. Uh, you then you should have all the opinions because you haven't seen it. Yep, right. Uh, it, the the trailer of it did it no justice. I mean, it is sappy, satrin bullshit. If you're a stand-up comedian and the, that pure of a like, oh, man, we're supposed to call out this bullshit. Mm. But the other perspective is, it's not a stand-up show. It's a one-person show, and oh. it's a fantastic one-person show. It has a narrative. It builds an arch and a twist at the end. It's a classic formula that's used by British and Australian comics. Right. And American audiences aren't attuned to that. So the first thing we're saying, that's not stand-up comedy. You're like, Tech, eh, it's a gray area. It is what it is. Yeah. You either like it or you Were don't. Were you entertained? That's the question. I hate watching it because I I also find like anything that's like. Uh, overtly emotional on point you mm-hmm. know i'm overcoming something i'm always going to be like ah go fuck yourself right but that's just because of my own shitty jaded kicked around attitude from being beaten around most of my life and see, i can't project that again, on this other person's as, journey as a self-aware person you recognize it yeah you have to because yeah. i don't want to sound like one of those douchebags and if i start ripping on it i want to be funny like right. I, I i didn't make fun of it but i didn't make fun of it the way everyone here's my opinion like that's that's the thing you got to, like, I, I get caught in this trap. I don't know if you get caught in this trap. You, you get an opinion, mm-hmm. and then you put it out there like it's good. You know what I mean? I try to or, avoid that Or nowadays. like it's a joke. As right? most, as much as I can. This, I think yeah. it's come with age. Yeah. I've started holding back my opinions more and more because I'm like, Ugh. I don't want to deal with this shit. Yeah. Well, I don't want to do that because I'm all about putting my opinions out there. That's all I have. Mm-hmm. That's really all I have. And you know what? I don't put a lot of stock in them. <laughs> I'll do a lot of work for them. Right. I'll put a lot of work in them, but I'm not going to put a lot of stock in them. So if people are like, go fuck yourself, blah, 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 I'm just going to, I'll have a different argument. Someone got mad at me online about, uh, oh, I, yeah, uh, I did these garbage pail kids where I placed it with just all the white women that were calling cops on black kids. <laughs> So there's barbecue Betty and, and, like that. and I just used their pictures and did the Photoshop outline for it. It was a terrible time for me to take a sip. Oh, it was a perfect time. I'll take a spit tech on a podcast. I will take it. Perfect. If I don't get you to pee yourself, I haven't done my job. Oh God. Uh, well, it got, it did really well. Yeah. Uh, Cuba shared it and I think that helped out immensely. Right. Uh, cause after that, a whole bunch of other people shared it too. And it ended up getting like 10,000 shares. I've never had anything hit like this, yeah. but from that comes the comment section of nightmare people. And this oh, one yeah. person I know from Denver was just like, you know, what about men? <laughs> like, and I was like, we'll get to that. This is just, just, just these uh, four shitty people that are racist. This is a race. Don't make it a sexist argument. We're having a racist argument. <laughs> we'll get to the sexism. Right. <laughs> and then like, just coming like that. So while she's yelling about that, I started yelling about therapy dogs. <laughs> And people that abuse that, <laughs> abuse the system. They're not really therapy dogs. They just put a vest on them. And so just having my own I'm arguments. Like, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. Like, oh, are we just going to have a rational anger and lash out? Okay. I'll join in. I'll do it the same spirit. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> I don't know. That reminds me of an episode of South Park where they're just, that town is bitching about something. And all of a sudden the guy's like, and what about those lids on coffee mugs? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay, let's do it. That's what the internet's for, okay? I'm not going to emotionally hate on you. <laughs> I'll like your shitty comment. I'm going to like it. I read it. You took the time to wrote it. I'll, I'll, re- I'll read it. There you go. Uh, for the, with the Hannah Gatsby thing, I'll, I, what, like, I have an opinion on it, but I'm not going to just state an opinion. That's not funny. Right. I learned this from the Fat Jew thing. Listen, <laughs> when the Fat Jew came out and he was plagiarizing and stealing people's memes mm-hmm. where the fact that we value memes i don't even want to get to that but this one guy 
that was trying to lead the charge, like because he was doing a book tour. He was like, "We're gonna set up a petition to Barnes and Nobles and CA to not work with this guy." I'm like, "That is not funny at all." <laughs> we're comic. We're supposed to be funny, and we're gonna do something this public. Now you're taking yourself too seriously. Right. All right, fuck you. I'm gonna dress up as the fat Jew, and I'm gonna do my own book signing oh, tour. I remember that. Mick, yeah, I'm gonna mimic what he's doing. But if he's stealing that, I'm just gonna steal him. <laughs> I remember and everybody that. can bring in books, but don't bring in his book. I'll sign every other book as if I'm the writer. <laughs> I remember you doing it's that. It's funny. Yeah. It's just being funny. And whether it does good or not, at least we're, having, we're making right. fun of a dumb thing. Right. So with the Hannah Gatsby thing, it's, yes, it's her emotional art, and she's really putting it out there, and she's changing lives, and people are fucking crying in their living rooms, typing out their hyperbole tweets. Okay, great. I'm glad you have that emotional thing. I'm not going to respond to it with some shitty thing saying you're wrong for liking something. Right. That's boring. Uh, uh, or, uh, or whatever. So what I did is I just made a video that took her trailer mm -hmm. for, uh, for her stand, uh, for the, for the one person show. And instead of having, uh, Hannah Gatsby on it, I put the ocean. Mm -hmm. So all the cuts was to a calm ocean. <laughs> Just a serene ocean. And then cuts to audiences clapping and laughing and just being moved. And just really listening to the ocean. As if it was a stand-up special for the ocean. Because at some point Netflix is going to do that. <laughs> they may send you an offer. <laughs> I hope so. It was a beautiful ocean. But like I took the same cuts that they did. Like I really went hard to like, you know how you do a mid mid cut mid shot mm -hmm. fit up close and then the, the full back for the audience shot? Well, I did the same thing with the ocean. And I did the same beats as the... As I'm going to have to go back and find this. You know, just little things like that. I'm going to do a little work. I'm going to have a little fun about it. The people that get it will laugh at it. And the people that really love the special will appreciate that I'm not shitting on the special either. Yeah. I'm kind of shitting on the idea of like the saturn and like that. It's not a funny thing, but it, it doesn't have to be. Right. You know, it's an, it's an hour. It's a one person. It's just, it's just a fucking show. It doesn't, everybody wants to dictate what stand up is to them and, and what it should be for everyone else, but there's so many different voices out there. Yeah. Like, do I think uh, Cameron Esposito is funny? No, she's not. Do a lot of people think she's funny? No, actually, not really. <laughs> Most people think she's not funny, but there's a lot of people that still love what she does and supports what she does, and, and she expresses something that they connect to. Yeah. And they should be allowed to have that, and we should be allowed to make fun of it. The, the both things can exist and then they can make fun of us for making fun of their stuff. And then we can make fun of them for still giving a shit and defending their stupid thing. <laughs> it's all good. I like the way you take things full circle. You take things full circle a lot in your act too. And you, you have a way of taking things full circle. And so you're saying I can laugh at her and they can laugh at me and, you know, kind of thing and I, I i hear you do that kind of stuff in your act too where you're able to take a topic and run with it full circle and bring well yeah it i want to be fair around. like there's other points of views out there right and uh i don't one one it's i mean it's not a lot of comics don't have a point of view yeah they really don't have a point of view and especially uh, not in the beginning for sure well especially at the beginning but mostly a lot of them succeed right now to a certain level without a point of view mm -hmm. because that's safe. Yeah. Oh, it's easy. It's just, it's fun. It's funny. And I, I wish I could do that. I don't have that mindset. And sometimes I get, I feel left out, you know, when everyone's having their good time <laughs> and I go up with a point of view and then they're going to shit on me about it. Oh, all right. That's, you're going to do it. Uh, and then I like to fluff it up. I have fluff jokes too, that I just like yeah. comedy's comedy. But at the end of the day, there's got to be a perspective there. I feel for myself, I want to have my perspective, but I don't have a perspective on, on things all the time. Yeah. So, so a lot of times I'm questioning and then the part of questioning, which is where I think comedy really comes from is just questioning is get Socratic is okay. What is this? And then what is the other side? Yeah. You know, I want to be fair. I don't want to be one atonal. Like I don't think a pain, I don't think, I don't believe a point of view should be one note. Right. You know, and I hate using the term devil's advocate because that sounds so like there's only one side. There's only one, there's only two there's, sides. Yeah, yeah. And and there's uh, multiple perspectives right. that come to things. And sometimes the funny is in a whole different perspective that you never thought about before. But when you think about it, you then you can do it in the bit. Right. Like um. Like and this thing on trans that I'm working on, 
where I think it's really interesting. Like I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out why people have a problem with trans in general. Mm -hmm. Why are they uncomfortable? I was like, why was I uncomfortable? I was like, well, sexuality is an uncomfortable thing for me. Right. When I was a kid, you just tell you, oh, you're supposed to be shame. You know, I come from a generation that can only come from shame. Mm -hmm. This new generation can just come. They don't, they don't need the shame. (laughs) I'm very envious of them. Uh, but but you grow up in the nineties, you need to feel bad for this. And that really goes to work. All right. Um, so when you, when you look in the trans thing, like, I feel like a lot of people, when, when a man says he's a woman and you know, the, I'm, I'm she, this is the way I want to be. And because it's now out in the public, uh, uh, milieu, the consciousness that we're all kind of approaching it together as a nation. Now we're all like, right. all right, well, we got to deal with this because we let the gays get married. Here's the next one. Uh, I feel like people, the, the I, I tried multiple metaphors and allegories trying to figure out why, and the closest I can get to it is the way people act when a man becomes a woman is the same way people act when an when Russell Crowe says he's doing music. <laughs> and then why is that so? Why can't Russell Crowe be a musician with thirty odd foot of grunts or whatever? <laughs> no, we can only think of you as one thing. How dare you challenge the way we already typecast you? And see, this is the genius of you and your analogies. This is what I'm talking about. I don't. I don't think it's genius. I just think it's. Uh, it's just. It's a perspective I haven't heard somebody mention before. That. Yeah. It's well, and, and that's the goal. I want to find. Like, listen. Um, in Austin, we have uh, uh, several trans comics mm-hmm. who are fucking funny. Mm-hmm. And there's no way I'm going to ever come close to touching Karina Magyar's relationship with being trans woman. Right. I, I, there's no way I would ever try. And so I can't even apply myself to that. Right. But it, it's not going to stop me from approaching the subject and right. thinking about it and coming up with a perspective that maybe she hasn't attached. Right. Because I remember when she made the transition mm-hmm. and it was, it was, oh, wow. I only knew you as this and now you're this. Yeah. Oh, this is challenging a whole different, you know, it's like, right. it's like oh, look how happy you are. Oh, look how funnier you are. Right. <laughs> Way better now that you feel more yourself. Yeah. You know, and seeing that growth is, it's, it's fascinating. And then, uh, listening to her interview had a huge impact on me too. Well, she's, she, she did an interview with Valerie and it was, it was like, wow. Like, and, and very, she, she gave so much grace for people all having a learning curve. Oh yeah. That, just... bi- that bitch prepared. <laughs> that bitch prepared. One, uh, for many years she was a libertarian dude. <laughs> so she's got to give herself some grace. To herself, because she knows where those persons, she had right. those same thoughts. So she understands where it comes from. And she's not like, a, she's not a complete bitch. You know? Right. She's sympathetic and she has to deal with these in the open mic circuits. Yeah. She's like made herself kind of a matron of Austin Comics. She's another one that does amazing full circle jokes too, though. I can see like the parallels. Yeah. Um, but we're talking about you. I there just, we go again. I'm like, we're. Ugh. I know. Okay, well, so in dealing with that, like, uh, so here's a subject that she has complete authority on. Right. That I feel a lot of people, when I start talking about it more, or sometimes will be like, oh, you shouldn't be there because you're a white male. It's like, well, I don't have time for you. Right. I'm a, like, you, sh- you should want white males talking and thinking about this, and maybe they'll grow from it. You don't want to, like, force people to stay in one generalization. Right. Or that they don't have a voice. because They still vote. Everyone's got a voice. <laughs> You can use it. You yeah. don't have to listen to it. If you shut down on them, they're still going to vote. Yeah. I like still got not. I mean, I'm yeah. never going to vote, but <laughs> oh. I, I yell at shit. And, uh, and, but you still got to come correct. So, like, my perspectives are like uh, uh, my questions and the, the, the comedy that I choose which way to go on the subject goes with my own personal stories and the people I know. And also, like... Like I, 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 I've seen it. I, I've talked, uh, I have a big long story about it yeah. where I can attach it and, and explore the subject with the audience who, and give them the qualifications. Like you don't want to qualify too much in comedy. It's been, listen, I'm not a bad person, but right. you know, there's, there's a lot of like every conversation now is a qualification mm-hmm. followed by a bold statement we all agree with, <laughs> you know? So I, you don't want to get caught in that trap, but at the same time, an audience, like if I'm talking to some fucking idiots in Dallas, some Trump voters, and I start talking about transgender people should be treated like, you know, people. But you can't just say it like they're fucking pieces of shit for having a knee-jerk, gross reaction. Right. They're going to have that reaction. 
So how do you plant seeds into them to get them laughing and maybe relax a little bit? Going, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. You know, I still don't have to agree with it, but it doesn't mean I can be a piece of shit about it. Right. Because you, you find this, it's like, oh, this is, this is the most fun I've had in comedy. Like, it's the one benefit to, to having Trump in office. The yeah. one benefit is uh, when I perform in Texas and I do these, like, clubs where they're, they're out there like, fuck, yeah, go president. I get the shit on the president. And when they get mad, I go, no, no, I'm from Texas. Fuck America. <laughs> fuck the Confederate I've heard flag. I've you say that before. I'm all about the Lone Star flag. Man, I don't need the stars and bars. The Lone Star. Like, you just play with it. <laughs> you use their Texas pride against their American pride versus their Southern pride. And their heads explode. Yeah, they can't deal with it. Yeah. They can't deal with it. Because <laughs> Texas always should trump everything else it's in like their a, mindset. It's like a whole other coexist sticker for them. They're like, what? Yeah. It's just the Texas flag, American flag, and Confederate flag. I don't know what this is. Sometimes it's all on the back of the car. I've seen the Confederate flag next to an American flag next to it. I've seen that. Yeah. But when you use it against them, then they're, and then you point out that this New York fucking mobbed up banker real estate module is really reflecting your blue collar values. And then they're really confused. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to. but you do it playfully. And then without the smugness, and then I'm, I'm totally just fucking with them. Right. Cause I don't give a shit about any of that. Fuck all of it. Do you ever imagine they go home and cry in the shower? No, they don't cry. <laughs> they don't cry over those things. They cry about everything. It's like, uh, uh, just the whole snowflake thing. You love snowflakes. You got them on your coasters. We were talking about it. Uh, yeah. You got your snowflake fetish. Um, how mad are you that that is now a slur? I ignore it. Right? I ignore it. I just let it roll off me because I'm like, eh. Well, know. I tried to get angry about it at first. Uh, so full disclosure, if nobody knows, I collect snowflakes. And look at me. I worked in full disclosure. I hadn't said it yet this episode. I have a habit of saying that in every episode. Yeah. Um, Valerie's going, yeah, she worked it in. Um but yeah, no, I, I let it roll off because I realized like I'm not gonna quit liking snowflakes. Yeah. The actual symbol. Well what does it even and mean? It, yeah. That's the problem. Like I, I remember it was the conservative jargon the, to get back to the lexicon mm-hmm. and not get in it. Conservatives like, oh you snowflake, blah 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 blah. And then all the liberals are like, Ah, oh, you're the snowflake because of blah 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 blah. But what I don't think anyone's taken into consideration is that the only reason these guys are, are throwing the word snowflake at people is because they can't say faggot. You're right. Now think about this. How progressive is that? <laughs> that means they're kind of learning. They're trying. They're, they're trying. They're, they're, they're making efforts. They're attacking PC culture by calling it snowflake instead of faggot, which is pretty PC of them. Right. They found something that is uh, neutral. Yes. As far as Le- like like the the whole the, the whole idea of controlling speech to control ideas right. does exist and is kind of con- happening. Uh, you saw that in the LGBTQ community. It's like yeah. we control the language. This is what we refer to be called. This is how we, like that's how you control the conversation. It happens to work. It happens to help kind of keep an even balance when people just want to marginalize you. So the fact that they're using snowflake <laughs> to clean it up a little bit. Something's working. One small step for man. Yeah. So, where are you headed now? I have no fucking idea. Okay. I, uh, I mean, the, the, I, this next week, um, I'm with Sam Morrill in Dallas. Uh, and then I got bu- bookings, uh, like a few shows here, like just whatever showcases I get here. Well, I don't necessarily then, mean literally. I mean, uh, I know you're working on the road some. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you're doing gigs in town uh, when you're back, right? Yeah, when I'm back, I, I, I should hit up Mike's more. I've just been way depressed and in my own head about it. And the stuff I'm writing doesn't have a joke for me. So you've yet. restarted your cycle, too, though, because you just you oh, finished the album yeah. and, and now you're back trying, in that cycle. I need to read, and I haven't been reading, and I've been, I've been putting stuff off. Like, I, I want to talk more about technology, uh-huh. artificial intelligence, how it works with how I view the rise of sex robots, the more feminism is talked about, mm-hmm. the more there seems to be more sex robots in the news. Mm-hmm. As if guys are just saying, well, I guess I'll fuck a robot. <laughs> Treat a woman with respect. <laughs> guess I'm fucking robots. You right. know, whatever. Like, there's, like, <laughs> that's funny, but it's like, how do I get to it? And what's the whole point that I, I need the to... The flashlight's at home going, what, I'm not good enough for you anymore? I have a flashlight joke. I'm not proud of it, but it's working. And it saved my ass. And this whole rant about technology no longer being progressive mm-hmm. and how apps and, and the idea of being an Uber driver is somehow progressive to us. 
<laughs> like needing a second, third job is to survive as progressive. Like, so I, I have a point of view and this, I just don't have the joke there. So the, the new point of views are starting to solidify. Yeah. Which means I need to, you're in that yeah. flux state, right? Yeah. Now. It, yeah. It sucks. It really hurts. <laughs> <laughs> I did this whole run and I kept trying to do it here and there. I'm like, oh, I'm not even, I am sound like an idiot. I sound like a preachy asshole. There's got to be a joke. You're working it out. Yeah, I guess. It's just harder because I'm trying to talk about harder shit. That's how you grow. Uh, hopefully. Or that's how you get stunted. <laughs> <laughs> Have you gotten stunted yet? Oh, yeah. We all get stunted. It's, okay. This is the whole, this whole thing is just uh, like, there's nothing but stunting. Mm-hmm. And then you overcome it, or you find an angle, or you, you switch around, or you or you relax, and you stop overthinking it. Like that's the beauty of comedy. There's so many different directions to go with it. Like when I write, sometimes I write on the laptop, sometimes I write with a notebook, sometimes I just work with a book and highlight thoughts and ideas mm-hmm. that spark something in my head. And you do all those. Di- sometimes when I write, I make brackets where I put here's the point, here's why it's funny, mm-hmm. and then I'll add a third bracket. I go, this is the point, this is the funny, this is the twist. How do I go in complete different direction? Right. And then I start like thinking it visually. I, I, I try to, because your brain, your brain adapts to laziness. Mm-hmm. Your brain doesn't like, the, especially the older you get, the brain doesn't really want to work. Right. Not really. You know, the brain's looking for ways out. At least mine is. That's why basketball players get more efficient as they get older. Yeah. They find. Because they stop running around as much. They go, mm-hmm. that's my spot. That's what I hit. Right. So. I have to, to, to stay where I'm not just a three point shooter. I still want to have an all around game. I got to write in four or five different ways. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I use colors to do it. Sometimes I color code where I'm saying, or I, I change the shape of it on a Word document. Sometimes I go to a small notebook, medium notebook, large notebook. I just try to find all sorts of ways to keep my brain from getting complacent. Yeah. Because to me, complacency kills art. Yeah. Yeah. The second you're relaxed, the second you're comfortable. Comfortable is the is, is the death knell of uh, progress. Anytime you're comfortable, you're not going to really try and move forward. And that's all I have. I have to try and move forward. It, it, it might be directionless. It's absolutely aimless, but I have to keep moving in that direction. Yeah. There's going to be something at the end. I might death, most likely. <laughs> but something along the well, way might be nice. We're all headed, right? Yeah. So, you know, we're, that's, that's all I want to talk about. Yeah. That's really honestly all I want to talk about. I've been trying to do it just how I'm really fascinated that we're all going to die and no one's doing anything about it. Not really. Yeah. Who's curing death? Uh, now you're making me think of a podcast. Um, <laughs> Memento Mori. Uh, but so with death in mind, um, what next for you as far as uh, are you going to work on? Oh, I still next... even – I realized I didn't even answer that question. That's okay. Um, all I can work on is the ideas and try and figure out how to work smart in this business. Mm-hmm. Like uh, I'm not a cap- – In a changing Listen, business. Listen, here, here's yeah. the – well, in a changing business, but here's the truth of it. I'm not on Cap City's radar as far as what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. They like me fine. They put me on two moon towers. That was nice. They put me on the Austin showcases. I wasn't thrilled about it. Of course, my ego is like, oh, you should be on this or this, or you would work better with these comics. You Mm -hmm. know those comics. You know you'd fit better, but that's not what they're thinking. So I can't think about that. And a lot of people get uh, hyper tunnel vision, worried about what Margie and Colleen are going to think at Cap City. And like, I'll send them a veils, but like now it's more tongue in cheek. It's like, I don't want to bother you, but I... I know everyone's hounding them for work and I don't, I don't think I'm like, there's who's performing that you can say they shouldn't be performing. Right. You you can't. That's, that's the rule of it. When you look at a club week, you're like, Oh, who shouldn't be in that spot? Oh yeah. There's a lot of comics. Right. So that keeps you from being a bitter piece of shit about it. So when I send my avails, I just send pictures of John Hamm with the German shepherd. (laughs) And I'm just sending it over and over. And I send it every three or four months, maybe five months. I don't do it two weeks like a lot of comics or, right. or monthly. I just, oh, I got some open dates in the, over the next six months. If you got a spot, throw me in. Yeah. Uh, but let me know because I'm still going to, I'm still working nationally. Right. And I'm still in the clubs that are respected. I work the comedy attic. Mm-hmm. That's respected. So that feels good. See? 
<laughs> so you can have no, it's like show them. No, it's just it is what yeah. it is. Um, they're uh, you know like a lot of the sh- like the contest. I'm not a contest guy. Mm-hmm. I don't think I want to do it again. I only do it because one, it's a celebration of the local scene, mm-hmm. and it's support of the club. The club does really well. Right. All those all those people, all those free tickets come in. They're buying drinks. And it it's it propels the club forward and I do like the club. I love the club. Right. I love the people that work at the club. I love the ownership. But the contest isn't set up for anybody who has a long form kind of no, not art at all. to their to yeah. their set. It's so. set up for what Jeff Singer from JFL is gonna go, Oh yeah, that we can sell that. Yeah. And uh all, all the comics that have gotten it should be doing it. Right. Uh, what what they do afterwards is on them. Like and, right. and and it's it's the the thing that keeps me in perspective is going down that you know on a local sense. You know if we can talk about it. when you look at the FPIA winners wall, you can look at the people that what have they done afterwards? Mm-hmm. Oh, you still have to work. Right. And even then, right. nothing's given to you. And it's the lesson I learned in San Antonio, like seeing all these guys come in who are on their way down or on their way up because it was that kind of club. And you constantly just, having to reinvent yourself. and Well, yeah. not just reinvent yourself. It's just the bitterness and the weariness mm. the, and the expectations. And my attitude is no one deserves anything, yeah. myself included. So why am I going to – I can show up. I can do the time, but I can't have any expectation of anything more than that. So all I can worry about is what I do. Yeah. And if it's good enough, people will go, okay, we need that. We like that. And if it's not, then I have to create it myself. I have to create my own audience. Yeah. I'll do the, I'll do my own venues. I'll just do that work. I'll do my own tours. And the, luckily the clubs take notice and there's a lot of headliners are like great recommendations for other places. So all those things work. And at the end of the day, I still like Austin. Yeah. I still like the community and uh, it's fun to watch these kids grow and become pieces of shit and then get past, <laughs> you know, a little bit, they get a little piece yeah. of shitty and they, then they get the expectation of something and then they get past that and, you know, you, you, it's uh, it's nice, and there's yeah. all these cool mics, and every and all I can do is try and be positive. And when I see people like, "Hey, how's it going?" and and, and when people are being excessively shitty, just kind of like, oh, well, "Why, why is that guy sucks?" Yeah, you know, there's there's actual shitty people. Okay, fine, be shitty towards them, but this, this guy's biggest crime was pursuing his dream <laughs> and just not being good at it. Right. There's people that are fucking despised for the sole crime of just not being that good. <laughs> And so you try and get past that. Which should be punishment enough, right? That's on them. <laughs> you can't pay attention to that shit. Like, uh, there's a lot, I, I like a lot of bad comics as people <laughs> trying. I, I'm more interested in the trying and like trying to get right. better. That's to me is that's the energy you need. Cause there's a lot of people that once they get their feature set or even their opener set, they stop hitting the mics yeah. and they stop and they treat everyone below them. And you're like, nah, motherfucker, you need those comics. You need people, that energy of people still trying to get better mm-hmm. because the second you don't have that, then you're comfortable and you're complacent. And then you suck. Yeah. It'll get stale. Well, I have taken enough of your time, so I am going to wind this down and ask you, like I asked you in the beginning. This is our third question. <laughs> or the first one. That's the sign of a good interview. Yeah. When we've actually been able to have a conversation without without the my prompts. voice. What's with, your wait wait? Let the, me see this. Can I see this list? Oh, that has nothing to do. Oh, with, that's a different. That's list? a different podcast. I'm like, oh, nice. Don't You're read studying. That. You're studying for the other podcast. No, this is from last week. Oh, okay, um, okay. This is just my workspace. Oh, okay, um, okay. But I'm like, no, don't read that. That's also from October of 2016. Oh, a, it's a template. It's been a long actually. time. Actually. Okay. Um. So. Give me. What do you want to know? How about this? What do you want to know? Oh God, we don't even have time for all that. Just ask one question. Like the what? What? What do you feel like? Don't feel. This is gonna sound dumb, but I've done this before with the podcast thing. Okay. Like don't don't you don't have to feel rigid towards a script. No 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 I don't. No. Okay. I don't, and I feel like a lot of this has been open already. Yeah. And I'm trying to find a way to wind it down so that I don't keep you here until two in the morning. No, that's a good. That's good because I do got to go. There's <laughs> there's no conclusion. Um, and there's there's no end game. Right. Like a lot of people are li- like everyone I know in New York and L.A. are looking for end games. Right. But th- there's no such thing because you. Then that's what I learned from the Stanhope thing. Every time you're done with something, you you did it. If you get Conan, you got it. That's not it. Right. You can't. It's over. It's done. Right. You got to move forward. 
And that's all anyone can do in life. And I think the thing that fucks people creatively is we've, we're constantly looking for end games mm -hmm. and something that has none. But when you if you if you spend all your time looking for an end game, you're gonna you're, you're gonna find it, and it'll just end. Well, I hope you enjoyed getting to know Jay as much as I did. Go find his albums right now, High Lonesome and his latest Monster Ballads. They're available on platforms such as Bandcamp, Amazon, iTunes, and Spotify. And give him a follow at White Cotton on Twitter. And while you're at it, give us a follow at Comedy Wham. And go to ComedyWham.com for more interviews like this one. Go to iTunes, please rate and review us. Give us a some feedback so we know how we're doing. And as always, thank you for listening to Comedy Wham Presents. <laughs>